Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Exploring Sacred. Welcome to a beautiful brand new day. It is great to have you with me this morning. The chat room is open, so please do feel free to come and join me in the, the chat room or listen live from wherever you happen to be. I'm just notifying the rest of the world that we are live. Here we go. Wherever you happen to be, I invite you to relax, take a deep breath if you haven't done so yet today. Might be a good idea to do that. I suspect that today's uh, subject matter might bring up uh, a few emotions or a few thoughts, and uh, that's okay. That's why we do the show. It's all about exploring sacred and exploring our part in a sacred world as sacred beings spiritual beings having a having a human experience. So good morning, Del Marie. He Hane Washte Chue. Hello, Janet. It's good to have you in the chat room. This morning we are going to talk about ugliness in spirituality. And this is kind of a we could probably have a multiple <laughs> multiple episode series on this particular subject matter, but that that really is falling on the heels of what has been some pretty terrific shows here at Temple Within Radio. Uh, Terry Ruel, our resident psychotherapist extraordinaire, has done some wonderful shows about uh, the subject of why we see things differently in this world and in our experiences through our lens. So for those of you that are tuning in for the first time, um, and if it isn't your first time, but you haven't listened to Terry Ruel's show, Dear Miss T, uh, particularly the shows that she did entitled, Why Don't They See What I See? I think that that's a pretty terrific subject for all of us uh, to think about and uh, really enact in our lives, to be honest. I know that her shows have helped me tremendously. And a show that Sandy Herrick and I did a couple of weeks back called Agreeing to Disagree. Those are some pretty great uh, shows that uh, gave me pause before I participated in them, but also in listening to them. And coming up in April on Terry's show, she is doing a special on gaslighting. So there, there's a term that she enlightened us about uh, last week, the term gaslighting, and I'm just going to calm Gabriel down for a moment. He's getting up there in years, and sometimes he gets a little bit chatty when the doors are closed in the office and he hears a sound. Hard to believe he's 16 years old now. Crazy, isn't it? Good morning, Kimberly. Hi, Angie, Holly, <coughs> Kelly. Good to have you in the chat room. <coughs> so please do chime in this morning. Tap in uh, to your own experiences and let's have a discussion, a conversation about this, this subject matter of ugliness in spirituality. You know, years ago, it's been many, many, many years ago now, that my life really did take that hairpin turn from being solely employed by a corporate world to also being employed by the spiritual world. And I think, you know, yesterday Kelly and I were uh, visiting and uh, one of the things that she said to me is, you know, Dee, I think really your life work is working in the realm of spirit. And that's really your work. And I happen to agree with that. But there's this point, and I think that we can all dial back or go back in our own memories of when did we put our first toe and take our first step on a spiritual path? I'm not talking about religion this morning. I'm talking about that spiritual path when we're beginning to learn perhaps more than what our religion taught us, or we're perhaps diving into the mystical parts of our religious life, but the spiritual part. 
And I think if we all pause for just a moment, we can perhaps remember our first Reiki class, our first uh, going to a sacred ceremony, our introduction to angels, or perhaps a personal experience that woke us up. And maybe that experience was when someone that we love passed on from this physical life into spirit life, and maybe they visited us. Maybe they gave us signs and wonders that made us wonder and took us down the rabbit hole of spirituality. And I believe that there's a honeymoon period, oftentimes when we take our first steps on the spiritual path, where everything it seems so magical, mystical, wondrous, loving, maybe a little scary, maybe a little bit like nirvana that we've discovered Shambhala here on earth, right? We can maybe all remember those moments in time. And we can also usually remember the first time that those thoughts are shattered by humanness, human ego, human anger, human ignorance, the path of being human. And when that happens, some people will just, as they say, flush the, the baby, you know, out with the bathwater. Others continue to trudge on. Some stop cold on their path. This isn't for me if it's going to be ugly. <laughs> and others seem to muster up and radiate more light in the face of challenge. Some become quiet. We can all think about those times, and I think that we, for the most part, can agree that when we encounter ugliness in spirituality, it hurts. It makes us question ourselves. It makes us question even our own common sense. It can make us question our connection to Creator, to creation, right? I have met people who were literally slapped in the hands, on the hands, by their spiritual teachers. And the first time that I heard this, I was shocked. What do you mean your teacher slapped you on your hands because your hands were in the wrong position for that particular Reiki symbol? What do you mean that that happened? What do you mean that they emotionally battered you for not remembering perfectly, right? Shocking to me. Appalling to me. And with the advent of social media and the magical screen that separates us from the physical hand slap or the in-person, mental, emotional brain slap, emotional slap. We now have a screen, a smartphone screen, a laptop screen, right, a tablet screen that separates us from the results of our actions in the physical world. But I will tell you that it does not separate us from the non-physical reaction to our behavior. And I'm going to walk over and shut the door now that Gabriel has calmed down a bit. We can all just think about that for a half a sec. One thing about exploring sacred, you know you're in my home out here in the enchanted forest because my critters do... <laughs> do uh, participate in my in my podcast so i have to take care of them as well <clears throat> during this show so it's really like being with me at any given time all right let me take a little look here in the chat room <clears throat> rob coulter is saying hey rob i remember the first time i overcame my fear of witchcraft because my first Reiki teacher was irresponsible 
and I realized the only way out was through. Oh my, yeah, the w only way out is through. That is, there you go, Rob. Holly is sharing, I was let go by the church I worked for as I wouldn't go along with the darkness that I saw going on there. The, hypocr the hypocrisy was overwhelming, but I felt confident in what my soul was telling me to do. Thank you for sharing that, Holly. And Tara is saying, good morning, everybody. Hey, Tara. Uh, my sissy poo, my sister Del Marie is adding, definitely experienced my shattering of my spirituality at the age of five, just when I learned about the beginning of our spiritual life. Those, uh, those schools shattered a lot of spirit. A lot of spirituality, those boarding schools for young Native American children and probably for a lot of children who were sent off to some form of parochial school away from the family, right around, right around that time when our spirit is beginning to blossom fully around the age of five through eight, I think, in my experience. It can become shattered. And those that shatter it can be adults that hold or seemingly hold a place of power. When we are disempowered by someone who says that they are our teacher, our guru, our whatever, we can be permanently shattered. Or we can find a place in our lives where we begin to look back and pick up the pieces. And for some people, it happens as young as five, as Dell is saying. And for other people, it could have happened last week. Spiritual ugliness does not have a timeline. In thinking about this subject, it brings me back to many of my teachers, many of my teachers, over the course of my 58 years, and they've come in many shapes, many forms, many pathways, but perhaps one of the teachings that I've remembered best about the subject of spiritual ugliness and the path came from one of my uh, Native American elder teachers. I've been blessed to have many of them in my life. And I remember about 16 years ago, Geez, hard to believe it's been almost 16 years, 15 years. When I heard the words, if they tell you that what they talk about, what they preach about, or what they write about is the only way, then you need to turn around and walk away. If what someone tells you that they preach about, teach about, right, <laughs> or write about, is the only way, Denise, then you need to turn around and walk away. Because there are many pathways, and each one of those pathways is personal to our experience of spirit. I am not saying, however, that there aren't certain tenets, right? Certain, as Dell always says, social mores, cultural mores, to be followed. I'm not saying any of that does not but you know what I'm saying is that if somebody says, but my way is the only way, my interpretation of that way is the only way. Personally, I question that when somebody tells me that their way is the only way. In fact, growing up in the household that I grew up in, one of the tenets of the household that I grew up in was that there are many paths to God, is how it was put. There are many paths to God, Denise, and not everybody is going to understand your path. And that's okay. Don't be another ignorant person. If you want to know about somebody else's path, somebody else's methodology, somebody else's understanding of God, ask them in a good way, politely. They either will or they won't share with you, but they probably will share with you if you ask them nicely. So this is a teaching that I've always grown up with. 
there are many pathways and in those many pathways it's like the levels of masonry right levels within the levels and then you add to it our own personal understanding or experience of Uh, my favorite teachers are, are not the ones that hand me a book full of dogma or sit me down to recite dogma. My favorite teachers are the ones that may hand something to me verbally or non-verbally or written that makes me question my own relationship to. None of us has the same relationship or understanding or teachings that come from our elders, whoever they are. I find it interesting. Todd and I were chuckling last night. In the past few days, some of my cousins uh, have been reaching out and telling me more about my ancestors in the south of the United States. For those of you that are listening from the other side of the pond or the other side of the world, uh, my biological family comes from the deep south of the United States. And the deep south uh, is considered to be Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, places in Louisiana, Louisiana as they say, those parts of the United States, which are very, very different culturally uh, than many other places. Here in the United States, we don't all think alike. We don't all dress alike. We don't all have the same accent or belief system or connection to spirit. We just don't. The United States is a very vast place. And if I were to ask my sister Del Marie to talk about the teachings concerning the Thunder Beings, from her experiences as an elder Lakota we, Lakota woman, Del Marie will explain to me as it was taught to her from her elders and her experiences as a Lakota woman. And she will share those with me. And that's what I will learn about from my sister. If I were to ask that same question of one of my Creek or Cherokee, or Seminole relatives down in Alabama, Georgia, or Florida, based on being Creek, Cherokee, or Seminole, their teaching may be slightly different or very much different than the one that Del Marie gives me about the Waukean, the Thunderbird, the Thunder Nation. But it doesn't mean that they're not valid interpretations from the elders. We all come from many tribes and many elders. And here in the United States, I think one of the beautiful things is that we really do come from, for the most part, many. And we are having to blend and create out of the many. I'm going to take a look. You're in the chat room. Hey, Carla Jo. Good morning, Katie. Kelly is saying, what a great teaching, allowing you to keep your mind open. I remember being warned that to look outside equals sin, wavering in my faith, etc. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people are brought up that way. And that's where the ugliness can creep in. That's where the ugliness can creep in if we are taught that what we were taught is the only way. And perhaps growing up in a military household where we moved every two to three years, I was not only encouraged to meet new people and ask questions, that was encouraged. And so being a seeker, a searcher, is something that was, uh, in my childhood, very much encouraged, and it really did amplify as I got older, but that's not always the case for everybody. Oftentimes, it's fear that precedes the ugliness 
What do I mean by ugliness? The ugliness that comes in shaming somebody, blaming somebody, punishing somebody, berating somebody, humiliating somebody. Normally, that sort of thing is done shooting from the hip without asking questions. Why do you believe that way? Oh, that's why you believe that way. That's what you were taught. Well, isn't that interesting? I was never taught that. How wonderful. I can't tell you how many Catholics that I've met, and I am one, how many Catholics that I've met have, who have never really considered that the saints that we pray to are kind of like spirit guides. And those Catholic people that say to me, I don't know, Denise, about you talking to spirit. And I say to them, but what, really? When you sold your house, I understand you put an upside down statue of Joseph in your front yard, 12 inches from the sidewalk, buried 12 inches down into the ground. And then you had to dig them up after you sold the house. What do you call that? In some corners, that might be called a whole lot of other things. Oh, you know, Denise, I never thought about that. Thank you for enlighten, enlightening me. I never thought about praying to the saints as praying to spiritual guides. I never thought about putting St. Joseph upside down in my front yard, 12 inches from the sidewalk, 12 inches down, and then digging him up and giving him a place of reverence in my new home as anything under than, other than that's what you did. I, you know what, now that you say that, Denise, that sounds kind of magical. <laughs> Does it now? Well, as long as you're saying that, there are great volumes about Coptic Christian magic. <laughs> really? The person who shoots from the hip out of fear may look at me and say, what you are doing is evil, it's wrong, it's ignorant, it's pagan, it's whatever. Ask the question. That's what I was taught. Ask the question in a good way. Now let's go back to social media, which I really don't participate on men, uh, much anymore because people, quite frankly, with that space of a very thin screen between themselves and the person that they lash out at. Facebook has created, um, and not just Facebook, I'm not going to just call out Facebook, social media and social media outlets has given people the opportunity to transform into something that either they really need to see a therapist for or that they really can't believe that they've become. So in preparing for this show, Todd, my Torian husband, did a little research about lashing out at people via, you know, websites or social media or digitally slapping people, put it that way. And he ran across a couple of articles that were interesting. And uh, people who, in their social media sites, are looked at as edgy and tough and rough. When they're questioned about that, or people say, yeah, you know, I, your, your uh, Instagram is so edgy. You're, you're kind of like a little mean. Well, you know what? I'm only like that, they will say. When my fingers are poised at the keyboard... I, it's like I become somebody different when I sit down and I begin to type. It's really not even me. I said, well, thank you for sharing that, honey. It's not even really me. Well, I think that it is part of that person. And again, it's probably as somebody who needs to, you know, pick up the phone or email Nicole Fix or Terry Ruel and get some anger management therapy. You 
you know, just last week. I watched something unfold that was very racist. And I don't consider all of the, the connections that I have on any of my social media. They're not really friends. I mean, let's all face it. Some of you are my friends and some of you are acquaintances and some of you, you know, we're just connected because we met somewhere and we want to stay connected with one another. So they're not really friends, which I think also adds to this idea that we can just, you know, hit and run, hit and run. Spiritual, uh, spiritual ugly, ugliness born out of fear that, well, if they write a book, people like, might like their book more than mine. If she does a podcast, they might like her podcast more than mine. He might be more scholarly than me. How will I look then? Well, they can't be right. I'm the one that's done all of the studying all of these years. And then there's the gaslighting. Terry Ruel is doing an entire show next month on gaslighting, and I've been on the receiving end of gaslighting both on social media and outside of social media, people will say to me, Dana, do you know what's being said about you on Facebook? Do you know what's being said about you on this podcast or that podcast? Why aren't you lashing back? Why aren't you speaking out and slapping back? Well, it's not that there are times that I didn't want to or don't want to, but I learned something. Learned a couple of things in my years. I was at Arval Looking Horse's place uh, with my sister Barbara for Sundance. And I asked him a question during a quiet time. I asked him a question. I said, Arvo, how, be, how come there's not like a better business bureau for medicine people? You know, not all of them are out there doing like really good things for people. And he looked at me and he laughed. He said, oh, I like that, a better business bureau for medicine people. He said, we don't need a medicine people. Or we don't need a better business bureau. Medicine people don't need a, be a better business bureau. Spirit takes care of that. And I looked at him and he said, I want you to always remember this. As it pertains to your pipe, to your chinupa. Whatever you put out there, in your prayers, in your words, in your writing, in your thoughts, will come back to you. It'll take care of itself. That's the Better Business Bureau. Creator, creation, spirit is the Better Business Bureau. And it can be hard. And there are times when we can't ignore what is being said, what is being written where we do need to say something, where we do need to speak on behalf of ourselves. And usually it's at the encouragement of friends or family. Usually it's our friends that start the ball rolling or family members that start the ball rolling. You find out really quick who your true friends are, don't you? who your acquaintances are and who your true friends are really quick. And we take note of that and we keep moving. Recently I watched someone who was very dear in my life be crucified uh, on the altar of superiority, of fear, of a whole lot of things. 
It was quite a spectacle. And when I was, it was brought to my attention, the first thing I thought was, don't they understand the law of cause and effect? What don't they understand about the law of cause and effect? What don't they understand about that? Or do they think that they are the exception to the rule in the world of law, in the law of cause and effect? Or as Arval said, <laughs> Spirit, a.k.a. the Better Business Bureau of And just because there's a screen or a microphone does not stop that law of cause and effect. What goes around comes around, right, as they say. have a little look. Carla Joe is saying, I've heard it said other people's opinions of me is none of my business. Yeah, some things you are best not to give energy to. Absolutely, Janet. <laughs> is it not the same with authors and artists? Yeah, it's, with, it's true with everybody. It's true in the office setting. Absolutely. Our mental and emotional compasses get directed in many directions while we seek our spirituality, but our soul's fee feelings are innate in us. Yeah. You all know what I'm talking about. So what do we do about it, if anything? A lot of times I stay quiet. Other times I will pipe up. I'm not blind to it. Trust me when I say that. <laughs> I'm well aware. Well aware. But what do we do about it? What do we do when we see somebody being crucified at the altar of I think it's easier really to help other people, don't you? To help defend somebody, to help them through that than it can be for our own selves. I think that that's true. Some things aren't worth giving any energy to. You're right about that, Janet. And other things, you know, I've had to hire an attorney before when it's gotten out of hand. And uh, to the degree then that I received the apology, I'm sorry that I made those things up about you. I don't know what I was thinking. Could you please tell your attorney that we're done? This doesn't need to go any further, Denise? Yeah, and you're going to tell everyone that you said those ugly things too, that what you said is incorrect. And then I will let my attorney know that this case is finished. That's how seriously I take my reputation. Because we are our reputation. We are our name. I have no hesitancy whatsoever uh, with social media to delete people that are connections of mine on any social media that post racist memes, any of it, racist about white people, brown people, black people, yellow people, purple people. If you're going to post a racist meme about any color, that's also ugliness and spirituality. Because on one hand, if you're telling people that you are a spiritual teacher or a spiritual guru, but you are posting racist memes, That doesn't equate, in my mind anyway, 
You're telling me you're spiritual, but you look down on people who have white skin or brown skin or dark skin or whatever skin. You look down on people with blue eyes. Don't tell me you're spiritual then. Just let me know who you are. But don't hold yourself up as a spiritual teacher. I, I have no problem cutting those people out of my social media. Because again, they're not really true friends. How do we define a friend? I have no problem with that whatsoever. Sometimes spiritual ugliness comes out of what I call defending the guru. Defending the guru. Whatever the guru says, I'm pretty certain, came out of the mouth of creation itself directly to my guru, and therefore, only my guru knows, right? Without inspecting what it was that the guru said or knows. Does that make sense? But my guru said, therefore my guru must be right. That's why I'm not much into gurus. Let me have a look-see here in the chat room. Del Marie. <laughs> but I am the, the QAnon shaman. <laughs> Rob. Uh, Del Marie is saying, I find it funny when I ask questions of some of the spiritual leaders or Wichasha Wakans, and they can't answer your questions, and later they avoid you. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up, Del. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Wichasha Wakan, that means holy man loosely, or we would say medicine man. Most people would say that. You ask them a question and they don't know the answer, and rather than say, you know what, God, I don't know. I don't know. Some people will pull it out of an answer out of an orifice we don't want to know about, right, in order to have an answer. It could be the wrong answer. And this is where it's so important for all of us to be empowered, Rather than just take my word about something, go inspect it and see how it feels to you. Carl Franklin, who I, uh, you know, everybody knows I adore Carl and Ortrud. One of the things Carl always says is take what I say and keep what feels right to you. Don't just believe everything I say. You can listen to me, but keep what feels right to you. And go from there. Tara Reitberg, you remember Martin Anderson, who used to come to all of the Coptic conferences. Uh, Martin has a photographic memory. Uh, he literally is a walking, living encyclopedia of, I honestly, he is like the walking, what do I want to say? Library at Alexandria, right? And whenever I spoke at a Coptic anything, he would always sit in the front row, always in the front row, and he would intently listen to everything that I was saying. And sometimes, right in the middle of a lecture, he would stand up and say, oh my God, you got that right. You're right about this. And he would, you know, take over a portion of what I was saying. And some people would say, well, Martin, sit down and shut up. Not now, Martin. Right? So he would sit down. He was an elder. He would sit down. And later he would say to me, you do your homework. You do your homework. The first time that I met him, I think I was like 43, and he looked at me afterward and he said, little girl, if you keep doing your homework, one day you're going to be a really bright woman. I was not offended by that because it came from Martin. None of that offended me. What it did do was teach me about the need for homework. 
I have lots of teachers, and I still do my homework. I still want to know more. And I think that that's a really good thing. And if you're a student of mine, you know that I encourage, go out there and learn more. Those of you that are teachers, you also know that sometimes we endure spiritual ugliness from students, from clients, colleagues, right? And those of you that are students of spirituality, you know that sometimes you endure ugliness from your teachers, from your colleagues, and from fellow students and seekers. When that happens, I encourage you not to stop looking. Reach out and say, this is what's happened to me. This is what I've experienced. This is what I've endured. I think one of the most beautiful lessons to Del Marie's point that I've learned from my Native American family members and elders is that if I step out of line or off the path, there is no screaming or yelling. The lesson is then taught kind of like with Martin, you know, afterward, on the side. I remember one time standing in the kitchen. We were getting ready to serve the Fort Robinson runners, and my sister Della, bad wound, was there. And I took her aside when she had a moment in the side of the kitchen, and I said to her, Chue, um, you know, you, you watch what I'm doing. I know that you watch what I'm doing. You see what I'm doing with what I've been taught and what people are teaching me with regard to the way that I'm being taught with the pipe. And if I ever step out of line, please let me know. And she said, oh, yeah, you're right. I do watch you. I've been watching you for a long time. And if I ever have a concern, um, I will talk to you about it. And, you know, we'll talk like this. It won't be in front of a crowd. It won't be in front of other people. I will just take you aside. And a couple of years ago, she was here visiting with uh, my other sisters. And I had them all in the house, which was a special treat. And we talked more about that. That if we do need to address something, that rather than do it in a public format, Take someone aside if you have questions. Rather than berate, ask. Those are great opportunities to learn. If you hear something about somebody, rather than just say, geez, did you read what was going on on Facebook? Did you see that TikTok? Holy smokes. Wow. Can you believe? Reach out. Say a prayer. Whatever it is that you do to, you know, soothe somebody who is being. If you don't know them personally, say a prayer that maybe it can all be turned around and balanced out. But if you do know the person rather than swallow the big pill and then contribute to it, Let them know that you're there quietly. I'm here for you. I see what's happening. If you know the person who's doing the gaslighting, reach out to them. Why are you doing that? What's the purpose? And why are you doing it publicly? What's the point in that?
And there are always going to be the people who just stand by and watch the train roll on by. Oh, well, there it goes. And I think that sometimes, you know, in avoidance, there are also repercussions for that. That's another show. Spiritual ugliness doesn't have to be. Good debate, great conversation, learning. Yeah. Tell me more. I want to learn more. And, you know, to your point, Rob, it can be the same thing in the workplace. Did you hear what somebody said about so-and-so? Well, I can hardly believe. Because what happens is that even if we are not outwardly saying anything about the ugliness, whether it's in the office, whether it's on social media, whether it's spiritual, religious, whatever, we can energetically feed into it. We can feed the belly of the beast by being voyeuristic. Right? We think that we're just being neutral, but we keep going back to it. We want to see what's next on the thread, right? We want to see what else is being said. In that voyeurism, we are helping to feed the belly of the beast. Energetically. Sometimes it's best just to let it alone if that we don't feel that we want to participate in any other way other than to, you know, light a candle or whatever. Say a prayer. Maybe they can all come to an understanding. There's an idea. Let's pray for understanding. Why is there a need to devour somebody else's anything? Why? If we see somebody outwardly really hurting somebody... I'm one of those people that tends to step in. If you're not going to step in, step out. Say a prayer. Stop being voyeuristic. Stop feeding the belly of the beast. If it stirs something within you when you see a debate or ugliness be ignited, investigate. Educate. Investigate and educate yourself. Don't assume that what you're being told or what you're seeing in a 60-second Instagram message is all that there is to know. Question. And for those that are out there spewing, be ready to be questioned, to defend your position. And in defending it, understand the universe is vast. And our understanding of the universe is vast. The wisdom and the knowledge that our elders, our ancestors held about the vastness of the universe is vast. Most of what we know today at one time came in an oral tradition. People didn't always know how to write or read. They could create art. They could sing songs. They could tell the stories and retell the stories. And in the telling and in the retelling, it's not all the same. There are variances. But all part of trying to understand our origins. Give people a break. Offer them a break. If their ancestral understandings and the teachings of their elders are different, and if their ancestors and elders look different than yours, give them a break. How about compassion?
And if you have to say you're sorry, say sorry. One thing about um, social media is I look at some of the things people post and I know who I will not send somebody to. I will not refer somebody to certain classes that are going to be taught. I will not refer people to certain practitioners. I certainly won't host certain people at the School of Sacred Studies just based on what they post on Facebook. There are people I will not take as clients or students. No different than an HR director at a corporation. They now look at what we post. If you're applying for a job in corporate America, right? Elise just began her career at the Children's Hospital and she was told, we do monitor what you post on Facebook and Instagram. Be mindful. When people say things like, well, when people are drunk, they don't know what they're saying. I think alcohol and drugs is personal, personally, I think it's a truth serum. Because I think people say exactly what they want to say and maybe haven't been able to say. And I think the same is true on social media. My cousin Bobby Jean, and Bobby, if you are listening, my, my cousin Bobby Jean Kang Clemens, first time I met her, she and I were sitting around chatting and she said you know Dana I just had this little rule in my household and that rule is don't show your ass in public don't show your ass in public there are some things that need to be dealt with within the four walls of your home and not out in public and I always giggle about that don't show your ass in public I like how she says it better with that Georgia twang don't go showing your ass in public. You should only be showing your ass inside your own home. We were talking about social media and how people show their ass <laughs> in public. So every time I see somebody showing their ass in public on social media, I just chuckle. And I take note about some things. Well, no, but I guess I'm not sending you anybody I know to that class. Or to that teacher or that practitioner. Nope, sorry. But thank you for showing your ass. Really, the moral of the story is I think that we maybe have all been on the receiving and sometimes on the giving end of spiritual ugliness. And there comes a time when we need to take a look at that and say, no more. No more. There are conversations to be had. They can be had in private. And righteousness is righteousness, but when it's your own ego showing righteousness, don't think that others around the world aren't seeing it. If you choose to show your ass in public. And if you are somebody who feeds the belly of the beast, maybe now you'll consider instead of feeding the belly, lighting a candle and praying for peacefulness or saying, what is this really all about? Or disengaging if it really doesn't interest or involve you. Or if you witness it with somebody that you know, you know, asking the question, why are you being so mean? Why are you being so hateful? Dang, that's ugly. There is a price to pay or there is a reaction for voyeurism. That wonderful wheel. It's always going. Goes around, comes around. Let me have a little look-see here in the chat room. Oh, if you're tuning in for the first time, if you would follow my show, that would be Words to live by, yeah. Absolutely. I've watched people be crucified for taking an unpopular position. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Ego, ego feeding it is. My mom used to say that also, Kimberly is saying. <laughs> Don't show your ass. I'm like, ooh, better not be showing my ass. So if you're participating in it, just knock it off. Nobody wants to see your ass flapping in public anyway. Knock it off. If you're criticizing somebody who's out there trying to teach from what they've been taught, knock it off. Knock it off. If somebody teaches me something that one of their elders taught them, I want to know what their elder taught them. And it's probably not going to be the same thing my elders taught me. I grew up as an adopted kid. So here's a for instance, what I was taught in my adoptive home is unique to my adoptive home. What I've learned from my biological family is different in some ways. It's no less valuable or valid, it's just different. It's just different. Chatting the other night with my cousin uh, down in Georgia about she collects uh, she has some beautiful Kiowa pieces and we were talking about the fact that my granny King uh, my dad's mother uh, was part Creek we were having this conversation about granny King being Creek uh, and grandpa King being Cherokee and so my cousin has these beautiful pieces and she was asking me how to smudge them, how to care for them. She's been collecting them her whole life. And she was, re she was retelling to me, because I never met my biological father, she was telling me, you know, the stories that my father told her, my cousin, about our Native American heritage. On both Granny King and Grandpa King's side, we're having this wonderful discussion about that learning we're living in a wonderful age that gives us opportunity to learn so much to be open to so much there are some facts that are just facts one plus one equals two sometimes a cow is just a cow and there are a whole lot of variables based on our experience with spirit. Because we all have one. We all have a soul. We all have a spirit. We are all connected, I believe anyway, to a realm unseen by most, seen by some of us. And our experience of that, the mythology of it, the retelling of it, so that we can understand it, oftentimes boils out to kind of some, some of the same story just said a little bit differently. And in the sharing of the stories, oh my goodness. You know, I took in everything that my cousin told me that my father told her because he was not aware that I was alive. He did not know that I exist. But he told stories and he passed things on to my cousins that they tell me that my father taught and that his father and his mother taught. And they're not going to be the same as what your parents or grandparents taught you. They might be similar. We can always learn more. And if you see ugliness in social media, and you don't want to say anything, you just want to be a looky-loo, stop looking. If you're somebody who wants to step in, do it gently. Do it kindly. If somebody is sharing their story, don't make fun, don't heckle. Everybody's got a story. If you don't understand something about another person's ancestral traditions, ask. Don't be another ignorant person. 
If you've gaslighted somebody, say you're sorry. Mea culpa. I don't know what I was thinking. You made me mad. I lashed out. Say something. If you can't say it out loud, say it in a prayer. I don't know. Send a card. Balance that wheel, right? One of my dear friends, Betty Davis, she was here one time and there were a group of local Native people. And one of the young men said to Betty, um, said to Betty, is, is Denise just a white lady? Is Denise just a white lady who is attracted to Native American things? Because she looks like, you know, I mean, she's got fair skin. She's got green eyes. She looks just like a white lady. He didn't know me. He had only been here for a couple of hours in my home. He observed something. Was I offended by, is she just a white lady? Well, there was a part of me that bristled, if he only knew. <laughs> right? If he only knew. No, I'm far from just a white lady. But. I gave him credit. He asked the question. And Betty gave the answer. She's a lovely lady. Betty, if you're, if you're listening, I know you're chuckling right now. She said, well, why don't you ask Denise? I'll tell you what I know that Denise has shared with me, but why don't you ask her? And then you'll know. And this was after he said some pretty derogatory things about me in public, about being a white lady. And then he was invited into my home. And I'm kind of, if I'm just a white lady, I'm a pretty nice white lady. He had the courage to ask Betty. Betty told him what she knew. And then he asked me, and then he apologized. He shook my hand and he apologized. And I looked at him and I said, well, thank you for asking. Now you know. And if I it was just a white lady, would you like me any less as a spiritual man? Would you like me any less? Would I be less valuable to you if I was just a white lady? And he looked at me and he said, no, I've learned a lot through your story about who your ancestors are, who your adoptive family is, and I apologize. I apologize. And every time I see him now, whether it's at Pow Wow or another community gathering, he always hugs me, shakes my hand. And I give him credit. He asked the question. He didn't assume. It wasn't easy. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't easy for my friend Betty. But it was all done in a good way. And he went out and told people that he knows in his tribal situation no, she's not just what I thought, what I conjured out of ignorance, not knowing, or out of gossip, or supposing. I found out, and she's a really nice person. Huh, wouldn't it be astonishing if more people did that? I'm so glad that my dad, the Sarge, taught me to do that when I was little. By the time I was eight years old, I knew a whole lot about Hinduism, Buddhism, what it's like to live in Mississippi, right? what it's like to be in a Cherokee family from Tennessee. I asked. They didn't have rosaries hanging next to the door over the Palm Sunday, palm frond stuck under the crucifix. They had eagle feathers, the Jones family. Jim and Portia Jones from Tennessee. 
I wanted to know why there were eagle feathers. I asked and they told me. Mrs. Jones told me in her very broken English. I learned. I didn't just go home and say, what's the matter with those people? How come they don't have a crucifix with the Palm Sunday palm frond stuck behind it and a ro rosary draping around Jesus' crucified head? What's the matter with those people? No. Dad, you know what I learned today from Mrs. Jones? I don't know, honey. What did you learn today from Mrs. Jones? I learned that she's Cherokee. They're both Cherokee. They're from Tennessee, Dad. Oh, wonderful, honey. That's great. What did they learn about you today? Did they ask about you? Yeah, I told them what I knew about me, too. I was only eight. Ah. Ugliness and spirituality. There it is. If we've participated in it, we need to say sorry in some way, shape, or form. If we see it, we can intervene either out loud or in prayer or ceremony. If we witness it. I'll tell you what, this past year has given me plenty of opportunity to clean up Connections on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Whew, cleaning house. People show their ass, and I'm like, oh, I don't like how that looks. Bye, y'all. Why? Because I don't even want my social media energy connected to that. It's all energy. It's all energy. If I just give everybody a pass, that means energetically... I'm giving everybody a pass. Whew. There it is. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, Holly. If you don't know, ask. There are no dumb questions. That's right, Katie. <laughs> dumb questions are the ones not asked. Right on. Thanks for kicking the door wide open, girlfriend. Just another reason you've been my bestie for 40 years. Enjoy the day, everybody. Get out there and shine, everyone, as only you can shine. Blessings be. Have a gorgeous day.